Hey everyone, this is Pastor Brian from Grindstone Church. We're so pleased that you're here with us for our online service for this upcoming weekend. We're so glad you've decided to join us. We're in Ruth chapter 2 today, continuing in our series called The Best is Yet to Come. But before we get to that, we're going to be led in worship by our Director of Worship Ministries, Christy Greenheis. As our call to worship this week, I want to read Psalm 108, verses 1 to 5. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake in the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth.
Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Brian, and today we're in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to keep seeing what God is saying to us as we read His Word together. Please join me as we pray before we open God's Word. God, we thank you that you are a God who speaks to us in your Word, and we pray that as we are people who are living under the umbrella of the authority of your Word, that you would speak to us clearly, that you would guide us, that we would use your Word as a writer for our lives to direct us and help us. So today as we read your word, will you help us to get to the understanding of the heart of the story? In Jesus' name we ask and pray, amen. So this morning I'm kind of starting with a bit of a difficult question. It's a bit of a personal question. It might be something that you think about answering up front uh, right away in your own mind, it might be something you're not really that comfortable answering, but it's okay. How many of you would say that you've hit rock bottom at a time in your life? You think to yourself, you know, this is about as bad as it gets. I don't know if it can get any worse if I get up today and, and face what's ahead of me, but this feels like it's about as bad as it gets. When we open up this book that's in the middle of the Old Testament, when we open up the book of Ruth, um, Ruth was living in a time, uh, Ruth and Naomi, the, the main characters in this book, they were living at a time that was called in the time of the, of the Judges. And coming out of the book of Judges, if you've read the book of Judges, by the time you get to the end of it, it's just really tough. 
things are just completely turned upside down. They no longer have received and loved God as their king. And very often they call evil good and good evil. So their environment and the whole place where they're living is in really bad shape. It's completely chaotic, their environment. But the character that we're introduced to at the beginning of this book called Ruth is a woman na named Naomi. And Naomi is living in Israel. Things are chaotic there in the environment. And then all of a sudden, her life becomes chaotic as well, too. So, shortly after we're introduced to Naomi, she suffers a series of losses. And these are particularly devastating because of this culture and this time, family is everything. When you're with your family unit, you depend on them for security. When you're with your family unit, you depend on them for survival. When you're with your family unit, you depend on them for work, for the food that you get every day. Uh, you know what, these guys, they didn't have refrigeration units. They didn't have all of the stuff that we have today. You depended on your family for everything. Family is everything in this culture. And so the story that we have in the book of Ruth, we're introduced to this woman named Naomi. She has a family. And in the course of this book, she loses her husband. She loses her two sons. And she loses her direction in life. She loses her support system right away. And this is absolutely devastating. And Naomi looks back on this at the end of chapter one and she reflects that uh, she had started this phase in her life in a state of fullness and now she was empty. And the only person who was left in her life was her pesky uh, Moabites daughter-in-law Ruth and she couldn't decide if Ruth was an asset or if Ruth was an embarrassment to her. So after suffering all these losses, Naomi decides to go back to Israel, where she never should have left in the first place. And now she has this daughter-in-law who she wasn't supposed to let her son marry. And the last thing that she's thinking is now I have this other mouth that I have to feed. Now I have this other person that I have to clothe. And Naomi, in this stage in her life, she's a bit on in years. She can't quite make things work for herself the way that she used to. And so she's thinking on its own, oh man, going back home, everyone's going to know that I left. Everyone's going to know that I messed up majorly by leaving, that I didn't listen to God by leaving, that we made the wrong choices together with my husband and my sons. They all made those wrong choices and then they're going to come back to that. Not only am I coming back into that, but I'm going to be coming back with this daughter-in-law in tow. And she's going to be this visual reminder every day of the bad decisions that we made together as well, too. And so you have uh, Ruth, who's with her, who's almost a reminder, if you think about it, of Naomi's negligent parenting of letting her sons marry people who she wasn't supposed to let them marry. And this is why we see this a little bit at the end of chapter one. We're like, wait a second, why isn't Naomi happier that Ruth wants to be with her on the way to Israel? Well, you can almost sense this frustration in Luke 1, chapter 8, where she's like, no, like go back home, go to your own people, go back to your, your gods in Moab. So it'd be a bunch of things. For Naomi to carry on with her, she'd be admitting defeat, uh, disobedience, and failure, and loss all at the same time. And so that's why she says that she's bitter, because she's lost everything, because she's at rock bottom uh, herself. And so we have this odd couple that's on their way back, making the trek back to Israel. One of them's bitter. The other one's kind of unwanted. But in the midst of this confusion, in the midst of this loss, and in the midst of this bitterness, there's a ray of hope. 
And it's kind of funny because you'll run past it really quickly if you don't catch it. But it says that they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So in this little note, the narrator hints that Naomi is not reading things correctly. She thinks that what she sees in front of her is final in her life. She thinks that this empty state that she's in is completely permanent. She thinks that God is done with her. She thinks that he's not going to be doing anything else in her life because of the choices that she's made. She only sees what God has taken away. And just as I'm reading this, just as I'm thinking about this, maybe you're thinking this too. When I go through painful situations, when we go through seasons of loss and bitterness and disappointment, boy, we think about all of those things. We think about all those doubts. We think about all those spots where we get discouraged. We only see what God's taken away. One commentator said that her grief blinds her to what God had provided for her. And so here's Naomi. After chapter 1, she's suffered all these losses. She's gone back to Israel. God had provided many things for her. But when you're going through loss, you don't see that very often. When you're going through loss, you only see what you feel that God's taken away. But she's returning to Bethlehem, and she's not going back empty-handed. She has Ruth with her. And Ruth, as we know, is, is very, very important to this story. So let's pick this up in, in, in Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Now a woman of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Oh, I'm sorry. I wound up in Exodus. <laughs> I was going to say, that didn't make sense at all when I started reading it. <laughs> now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Naomi's husband was named Elimelech, as you remember, so he's in her line and he's in her lineage. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone who's in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of the Limelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. What a nice workplace. Boaz asked the overseers of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She was the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves by the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. But whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water the jars the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me? The foreigner. Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland, came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you richly, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Hmm. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. So what's, what's happening in this passage is we, get, we see this beautiful uh, development that's happened, in particular in Ruth's life when she encounters this man named Boaz. You know, what's happening here with the fields, this is important to know as well, too. Uh, 
Biblical loss states that as something that's um, an extension of grace for people who struggle to find food for themselves was that they would inst be instructing reapers, so the people who worked in the fields, to leave a portion of it unharvested for people. And often this was on the outside of the field. So if you had a hard time finding food or, or work, um, or um, you know that, that you were poor, this was a system um, that God had set in place for people who had a hard time getting food to come and get it, to come and find it. If you if you want food, here it is. You just have to come get it and, and come provide for it for yourself. So the purpose of this was to allow the poor, the widows, the sojourners to provide for themselves by gathering on the outside edges of, edges of the field. Um, Ruth does not presume this will happen to her. Uh, she is uh, quickly identifying herself as a foreigner. She's from Moab. She's from a land that uh, is an enemy of Israel's. And she's taking a huge risk uh, by coming to Israel with Naomi because she, she has no way of knowing how she's going to fit in with this culture as well, too. But in hopes of finding favor, uh, a word that's often translated as grace in this story, because this book is all about God's grace, she asks permission from the young man in charge of Boaz's reapers if she can gather from this field. So she's a foreigner. She's asking if she can just step foot onto the field to try and get some food from the outside. And so she finds favor with him. He gives her room to come in and get some, get some provision for herself so she, she can create some food and sustenance for herself. Then she's introduced to Boaz, to this character who we are introduced to for the first time, who is of the lineage of Naomi. He's heard of the amazing faithfulness that she has displayed in her own life. He's heard about how she's left everything uh, to support and help Naomi. So what does he do? Well, Boaz, and remember, we don't see God's name here, but we see a series of happy coincidences here. Boaz just happens to give them something they haven't had in this whole story. Boaz provides for Ruth in a completely unexpected way, protection and provision. So everything that they have <laughs> been scrounging for, everything that they've had no sense of uh, for an indeterminate amount of time, suddenly this Boaz guy is here. He's gracious. He's impressed with her. And he provides, boom, provision and boom, protection for them. Well, Ruth is completely overwhelmed that she has been given grace as a foreigner. We see this in verse 10. Who are you to be gracious to me, a foreigner? And as, as it's been said before, she would have been considered an enemy of Israel's people. But as someone who's put their faith in God and in his forever promises, she is completely brought into their faith community. And so they look after her. And so Boaz and uh, these people who are here, they give her provisions, they give her protections. How does the rest of the story go? Well, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. So he's saying, let her go in farther into the field. Even pull out some stocks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. 
Now this is like a back to life moment here for Naomi. Naomi could have joined Ruth out of the fields, but she, but she didn't. And there's a little bit of an implication that she was so overcome with grief and bitterness that it basically incapacitated her from having the potential to go out and work for food. And so what Naomi is seeing here is, oh my goodness, God is still taking notice of us. God is still taking care of us here in our lives. He's taking notice of the living and the dead. Then Ruth told her, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. That's an immense promise to be given, a level of security in this part of employment here. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter. This is a heart of affection she's finally giving Ruth to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. So we see here, as the story develops, Boaz continues to show favor on Ruth by having her sit uh, with the reapers at this mealtime. He lets her gather farther in from the fields. He said, come on in, don't just hang out on the edges. Come on in further, come on in deeper where, good, where the good stuff is. We're gonna give you more protection. We're gonna give you more provision. We're gonna give you more grace um, just because Happy coincidence here again in the story. And so after Naomi's been in the state of bitterness, she starts to ask questions and she sees what's going on in Ruth's life. Her, her bitterness just starts to melt. Um, as you have seen when we read that part of the story together. And Naomi reveals a surprise. And, and in some of your Bibles, the language is going to be a little different here. But Boaz is a close relative. He is one of their guardian redeemers. He's, I might say, a kinsman redeemer. And so a redeemer, well, let's, let's think about this, this title because, you know, this goes somewhere. It, it gets played with a little bit, this title in this book. It's a role of caring for family members after losing family, and it holds the promise of help. It holds the promise of restoration it holds the promise of um, protection. It holds the promise of security. And it holds the promise of redemption, of being bought out of slavery. And so here are these women who have suffered these immense losses. And then in a completely unexpected, in a completely surprising way, now they have a redeemer. Now they have someone who's going to take care of them. Not just with one or two needs, but with like all of them at once. After they've been wandering around the desert, now they are in these fields of God's grace to them. And um, reading Ruth today, I just had a couple of reflections. And I know application is sometimes tough in narratives. I just have a question for you. And this is something that we all need to work on. You know, are you choosing to see the goodness of God in your life? You might be experiencing a lot of pain. You might be experiencing a lot of grief. Uh, but we also saw from Naomi's life that that grief can't blind us from seeing the goodness that God has poured into our lives magnificently through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Are you choosing to see the goodness of God? Are you extending grace to a foreigner? Are you extending grace to people who are not in the community of believers, who are not Christians? Are you trying to see them uh, in your neighborhoods? Are you trying to see them as your neighbors or are you trying to get away from them? 
know, these people that God's surrounded us with, they're there for a reason. So are you paying attention to the needs of the foreigners around you? Are you paying attention to the tangible needs of people around us? You know, again, getting back to neighbor care. Are you talking to your neighbors? Are you seeing if they need anything? Because these last couple of months, no matter what's said by the time we get to the end of it, and who knows how far beyond it goes, but are you checking in with people to take care of them and to make sure that they're okay? Uh, this is something that God gives us uh, with what he's provided for us, not just so that we keep it, but so that we give it to somebody else as well too. The other thing too, and this is more of a devotional thing, are you still surprised by the grace of God? Are you still surprised at what he's doing in your life? Are you still surprised at what he is accomplishing? Coming out of dark backgrounds, dark backdrops of things in your life, are you still really shocked and surprised by the grace of God that still applies to you? And I just want to leave you with that because that's a very worshipful thing uh, to be left with. And maybe you can go back and, 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 and re-sing those songs with Christy again if you want to think about doing that. But there's something that happens in believers where we start to hit a rut. And very often it's because we get too used to God's grace to us. God's stunning, shocking, reversing grace. And I just want to dwell there. And I just want to pray here. And we'll close with this because, man, you can't close on anything better than reflecting on God's grace. Let me pray with you. Father, we thank you that it is because it is by grace that we are saved. We are saved by grace through faith. Not because of anything we've done, but because of everything you've done for us. Oh God, it's not the, the, the strength of our faith that saves us, it's the object of our faith that saves us in the person of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, what another happy coincidence it is that we see in Scripture. And that later on we see that Jesus himself is referred to as our Redeemer. As the one who rescues us, as the one who protects us, as the one who completely rescues us and frees us from every kind of sin and, and slavery and failing and state of desolation we could possibly be in and instead gives us peace. Lord, help us to dwell here and be amazed by your grace for us. Help us to be amazed by your grace today. And Lord, we thank you for the gospel as we see it in Ruth. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today, church family. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I look forward to seeing you all on Sunday. Have a good day.